Senator, thank you very much for that question, and, and thank you for your decades of service to those issues, and I'm very well aware of that. I think you're right to suggest that as we think about our tools, our strengths, as we compete with China, it's our belief in human freedom, in human rights, in democracy, in the rule of law, in press freedoms, that really stands in opposition to an authoritarian dictatorship in Beijing. And so if we can marshal those strengths, and, and President Biden and his administration believe this is at the center of their foreign policy on Xinjiang, on Tibet, on Hong Kong, on the repression of the Chinese people, we can't just do that sometimes. Uh, we, can't, we cannot be silent if there are atrocities occurring, or in the case of Xinjiang, a genocide is occurring. We have to speak out. And you've seen the President, Secretary Blinken, and all of the officials have been very forthright about that since January 20th of this year. I think that will continue, and that will certainly be, if I am confirmed, a hallmark of what I try to do, speaking directly to the Chinese government in Beijing. I would ask also that you inform this committee as to how we can give you a stronger hand in dealing on these issues. Uh, we have passed sanction regime laws that have been used against oppressors in China, individual sanctions such as Magnitsky, as well as, uh, as sectorial sanctions have been used. Uh, and I think they have their effect. Uh, I, I, I think they're extremely important. Uh, but we need to also think beyond that as to what we can do to give you what you need. The competitiveness bill that the chairman mentioned, I think, is going to be an extremely important part of our strategy against, uh, in standing up to China's oppression on the economic front. But we should also be looking at what we can do as a Congress to give you a stronger hand in China in dealing with these universal rights. So. I, I would welcome your uh, advice uh, as to what we can do uh, to give you a, a stronger toolbox uh, in dealing with these issues. Thank you, Senator. And I would just suggest a couple of things, and I've spoken to the chairman and other members of the committee in my individual meetings about them. First and foremost, when the coronavirus mercifully ends and when the restrictions on China, there's a three-week quarantine in China for visitors at some point end, I hope that members of Congress from both parties will travel to China, and if I'm confirmed, I would like to help you to do that. I think they need to hear directly from our legislative branch on these issues. These will be difficult conversations uh, for you and for me with the Chinese leadership, but we have to have them. Secondly, I would encourage you respectfully to continue what you're doing, what this committee has done under the chairman's leadership and Senator Risch's leadership on a bipartisan basis to speak out and legislate when necessary and to sanction when necessary. Third and finally, President Biden was right on the issue of Xinjiang and the Uyghurs and the other Turkic Muslim peoples when he coalesced with Canada, the European Union, and the United Kingdom in multinational sanctions against specific Chinese individuals responsible for carrying out uh, the atrocities in, in Xinjiang. I think that can be helpful as well to expand the universe of um, expand our voice to work with other nations, perhaps through the NATO Parliamentary Assembly and your parliamentary exchanges with the Japanese, the Australians, and others. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Senator Jones. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ambassador Burns, thank you for your prior service and your willingness to serve in this capacity. Uh, I agree with you that if uh, we act intelligently, uh, the U.S. in concert with our allies in the West, uh, we can compete with China. Uh, China, though, has advantages in terms of very long-term, very strategic thinking, authoritarian. Uh, they don't have the, the, the back and forth of uh, uh, elections, that type of thing. So they, they've, they have utilized that long-term strategic thinking, while the West literally has not done much to counter uh, their infiltration into our institutions, uh, their stealing of our intellectual property since their entry into the, the WTO. And just like you to comment on, on how do we, you know, how do we counter uh, what they've done and how we do that effectively? Senator, thank you. I think it's I think it's a central question. We have to have a strategy to match China's strategy. 
Um, I think that is beginning to develop over the last several years in the, the last three administrations, President Obama, President Trump, and President Biden. And as I said in my testimony, what distinguishes us and strengthens us is the fact that we have our alliance with Japan and our alliance with Australia and South Korea. And uh, I've been involved in my past diplomatic career in intensive discussions with the Europeans. I think they're less uh, united, perhaps, in the European Union right now, but I sense that the Europeans are shifting to understand the threat, the threat to them as well as to us and our Indo-Pacific allies. So I think operating on an allied basis is the most important thing we can do. And, and sometimes that means we form institutions. So the Quad is an institution that both parties can be proud of. Republican and Democratic presidents have supported the Quad. And now President Biden is operationalizing at the head of government level, which we hadn't done before. AUKUS, three countries coming together. We need to build the institutions that are permanent, and that take this policy that we're discussing this morning into the 2030s because the competition with China will be multi-decade. Yeah, I, I, I do 